ideal, then yes, it, it, it affects how, how, we, how we feel and how we function, how we communicate. But where I come to church, this morning I had this, this thought of what a beautiful reminder we get that worship is not about us. I hate to compare us to persecuted believers. But I was saying to the team this morning, like when Paul and Silas were in prison, worshiping, singing hymns before God in the middle of the night, shackled, cold, broken, beaten. They were worshiping. Beautiful reminder for us. It's not about us. <laughs> so this morning as we as we worship and gather, um, I'd love to keep that thought in your mind. And I know we all know it's not about us, but sometimes we can project us onto God. This morning's this reminder of, nah, it's not ideal, but that's okay, because God is ideal. It's not perfect, but that's okay, because our God is perfect. Let's worship from that space this morning. And let's see what God wants to do in that space as we humbly come before Him. Let me pray, Lord, we thank You so much. We thank You we even get together, whether people are gathering in the room with us or they're gathering online. We thank You we get to come shoulder to shoulder saints, with other sons, with other daughters of the Most High God, encourage one another, praise you, fix our eyes on you, like your author says in Hebrews, just to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, so Lord, this morning we don't want to look left, we don't want to look right, we don't want to look forward at what's happening up here. Spirit, help us to focus on you and your Son and who you are. As we come before you, we know your presence is here and here in our hearts, but Lord, we ask for an intimate experience with you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray all.
maybe grace just to keep their head above water in whatever's going on around them. Grace to be strong when they feel there is no strength. Grace to be courageous when they feel afraid. Grace to be filled with hope for the future when their mind is telling them hopelessness is what's ahead. Grace to empower us to come around those people. Holy Spirit, I know you're doing a work in the hearts of your people. circumstances don't matter, but they fail in comparison to our great God. And it matters to Him. So Lord, throughout this grace, we want to just bring all circumstances before you. We see stuff going on overseas that is not of you. There's war and there's hurt and there's pride and there's power and there's fear things that are not of you and your kingdom. So in Jesus' name, we unite in prayer as millions of people around the world are. That you bring peace. Peace, peace to all people that are in war. Peace to all people that are suffering. Pray for wisdom for decision makers. Holy Spirit, may you influence in these countries and these governments. Pray for peace in this world. You're a good God, you're a great God, you stand in that this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
powerful, powerful that we can praise a God who sent his son to die for us, to fight our battles, to end the battles against sin and death and to, um, to give his life for us. I just really encourage us to stay in this place of worship and praise and adoration to our King Jesus. Can I have the helpers to um, hand out the elements? Thank you. Our King Jesus, who was humbled as a man and obedient to the Father to the point of death on the cross. In Philippians 2 verse 8, we read, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. He fought our final battle for us. And that's why we can rely on him in any battle that we're facing. Thank you, Lord, for your humility, for your obedience, and for your love for the Father and for us, Lord. We take this moment to just stop, pause, reflect, and be thankful. Thankful to our Jesus Christ who gave his life for us on the cross. Thankful that we can come to him with all our burdens and all our everything that's weighing us down, all our battles, and we can lay them down at the cross. I just encourage you in this moment just to reflect and be thankful, just to connect with Jesus and to thank him. If we take the elements in our own time, the bread representing his body, which was broken for us, and the juice, his blood, the blood of the new covenant that was shed for us. And then um, just take it in your own time, listen to the music and just connect and be thankful and Kristen will wrap up in prayer. that we'd rather be than here in your presence. At the feet of our King Jesus. first response to Jesus when he first met him was, I'm not worthy. I sometimes feel like that too. I'm not worthy to come before you, God. But through what we just remember, Jesus calls us in. 
Jesus, come. Jesus, I'll bring you rest, I'll bring you peace, I'll bring you life. In your own time, why don't you stand with us and we'll continue to sing and worship and song.
It's our declaration. It's our promise. It's our statement of faith. There's no place we'd rather be than in your presence. Thank you, God. In your presence, we find not just you, obviously, but all of who you are. We find freedom. We find peace. We find a God that will never leave us. He's faithful until the end. Lord, as we gather, as we continue this gathering as we learn as we talk as we laugh as we engage with each other and you Lord we pray for your blessing your favour your presence to continue through this place in Jesus mighty name we pray and everybody who agreed said Amen 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 what a beautiful way to start our gathering hey? God's a good God Hey, just before you sit down, what I'd love you to do is um, we're going to mix it up a bit. And we'd love you just to have a quick connect moment now. I know it's crazy, right? We're doing things different. So before you sit down, make sure you say good day to some people. Um, hug some people. Hello. I'm glad to do that. I don't know. I, not, I think I'm from Monday. I'm not going to allow to. So get all your hugs out now and um, say good day to someone. And we'll be with you in just a moment.
Okay, wow. How are we going this morning? We good? Go, so great to see everyone connecting. Sorry it took a little bit longer. I had a lot to sort out this morning, a lot to figure out. Hey, um, if you're new here, my name's Bo, and I'm part of the team here at Church of Christ, and we want to welcome you um, to Church of Christ Kalgoorlie, and if you've been coming for a little while, or it's your first time today, we're not going to embarrass you or anything, don't worry, but I'm sure you've been welcomed already by other people, uh, but I'd love to extend my welcome to you, and if you want to know a little bit more about who we are, and so we can find out a little bit more about who you are, not in a creepy way, in like a friendly way, um, we've got a little welcome pack that we want to give you for, for free, no strings attached. Um, There's a few little gifts in there for you, but also tell you a little bit about kind of who we are. So um, make sure you grab one of those after our gathering. They'll be out there just near the entrance and um, someone will be there to give you that. So make sure you make the most of that. Hey, I just want to, before I get into my message, a couple of things. Um, uh, A thank you first off and just want to um, talk about um, just the, the, the financial offerings that come into our church. So if you're a financial giver into the life of this community... I want to thank you and um, ask that you continue to do so, because uh, quite often what we can do and how we can affect this community, but also the outer community, is because of the financial giving um, of people that call Church of Christ their home. So I want to thank you for that, and most probably you can see different ways that you can give, and if you've, um, you've plugged into our church, maybe this year, you're maybe new to town or you're new to this church, um, this is a great way that you can invest into what God's doing um, here. So there's many different ways you can do that, so make sure you uh, check that out on the screen. And lastly, because we are a family, um, we have people coming and going, and uh, today we're doing a bit of a, a farewell to one of our favorite fa- families here. Um, they're, f- they're, I was going to say flying off, but they're driving off to Queensland uh, next week. So we're going to say goodbye, and we're going to bless this family off. So can I get uh, Francis and Janelle and Kiana's here, and Cassidy and Diego. Is Theodore here? Yep, he's sitting down there. Come up, guys. We want to pray for you guys. Give him a round of applause. You've probably seen him around if you don't know them personally. Francis, um, Francis wasn't going to drum today, actually, and then last minute, yes, was it yesterday? We had um, our, our other drummer, Benny Boy, because of COVID protocols, uh, couldn't come and drum today. So Francis kind of had a last little, um, a last little smash on the skins for us. So um, it was a great way to, to finish up his time here. Come over here, mate. So this family's been—is it ten years? Ten years. Ten years. Uh, these guys have been part of the church family and serving in all different ways. Yeah, it's beautiful. And um, we just want to tell you guys in front of everybody and just say uh, thank you so much for, for your service and for your love and for your engagement and your friendship. And I'm sure there's many, many people here um, that, are, that are wishing you the best and are going to continue their relationship with you in this new season. And um, you can always check us out online if you want to see what's going up in here in Church of Christ. Um, we want to bless you in this brand new season that you guys are in because I know God's got something really beautiful in Queensland for the whole family. And um, we can't wait to hear, hear the stories so actually, what one might do is, we might actually get you guys, I know you, I know you just came up, I apologize, I want to get you to come down, and if, if um, friends or family want to pray with us, I want you to come forward, it doesn't matter if it gets a little bit messy, that's okay, just come forward, if you guys just go down there, we'll come down with you, and um, if you want to pray to, if they've, they've had a huge part in your life, come forward and lay hands on them, and we're going to pray, and um, we're going to wish them well in this brand new season. If you want to stay where you are, stay where you are, reach out a hand, stand, sit, kneel, I don't mind, that's okay, and um, come around them. And uh, Steve's going Steve's gonna to pray them into this new season. Ah, oh, the prayer device, also known as the microphone. Just building the there climax. We go. <laughs> yeah. Father God, we thank you so much for this family. Father yeah. God, we just thank you for blessing us with their presence for many years now. And Lord God, we are excited about what you have in store for their future. Father, we're excited about the way in which you're going to use them in a dynamic way in Queensland, Father, to just shine your light ever so brightly. Father God, we pray for them as they travel. Father, for Francis and Janelle and the other drivers that take part as well. Lord, may there be sweet memories made as they travel back to Queensland. Father, may they be able to touch people on the way back with your presence and shine your light to those that are feeling down and lost and just need a, a great word to lift them up. Father, we just pray as they settle in back in Queensland that they will find their feet exceptionally well and fast. Father, they'll blend straight back in, Father. And that they'll get with a community of believers that will love them and embrace them and spur them on to do greater things for you, Lord God. We just pray for the kids as they settle back into a school, Lord, that they will make friends quickly. They will adapt. 
they will continue to learn and father that you will just bless them with those abilities and gifts that they have and continue them on in that wonderful journey with you lord god we pray for francis and janelle especially as they guide the household lead the household we pray that they will find work and have good work father we pray that they will look for you to direct or to direction every day with everything that they do that you will be first and foremost in the life of this family guide them and direct them as they make decisions regarding whatever it is going forward father and uh, lord god may they be a light to their neighbors to the fellowship that they join to the school that they mingle with and father just in the general community lord we just thank you for the presence and the impact i've had on us as a family we've grown with them developed with them They've rubbed off and given us a great sense of humour. Father God, I just pray that you will love upon them in a mighty way, in every way, and go before them with all that they do. We send them, Father, with love from the Kalgoorlie Church of Christ, knowing that they will never be separate from us, for there is never an end when it comes to family. It's just a, a, a longer distance to travel to sea. So, Father, bless this family as they go. In every way we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, give them a clap. Make sure you um, say goodbye to them um, after the gathering today as well. Beautiful family. Hey, who can remember what I spoke about last week? Just yell it out. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Vina was listening in the front row, taking notes. Hey, so last week I talked a little bit about the Holy Spirit and this little mini two-week series that we we're doing. And last week um, I spoke about um, how He is the He's the person of God, He's the presence of God, and He's the power of God. And uh, I just want to double-click on that power of God today as we kind of uh, wrap it up and talk about that concept. And I've I've, um, I've titled today's message "Same but Different," and I hope that it'll make sense as we go. Uh, same but different. So when we talk about this, um, this power of the Holy Spirit, this power of um, His agency here on, on earth, I want to talk a little bit about the purpose, but in a minute what I want to talk about is how the power and the purpose are inextricably linked together. Every time you have a purpose, you have to have a power behind it to actually be effective, right? Because purpose, if you know what you want to do, purpose without power is pointless. And power without purpose is problematic at the best. So these two have to be together just in general when we talk about people, when we talk about anything at all. Let me show you what I mean. I've got a little illustration here, thanks to Steve and Susie Logan, because of course I wouldn't own something like this. So here we have have a whippersnipper. So I borrowed this off Steve and Susie every, every few weeks to kind of um, whip and snip my weeds and grass and stuff. So you can tell I've done it before, can you? <laughs> this is a whipper snipper. Now the purpose of this is to whip and snip and to cut grass or edges or weeds in my case, whatever the case may be, is to do that. Now I know what its purpose is. It knows what its purpose is. It's got its parts in here. But what am I missing? I don't have any power. So the, I can, this can be purposed 100%, but without power, it literally is useless. So when I have this, which is its power, now if I plug this in and have power, but I forget what the purpose is, I'm just swinging it around. It's problematic, right? To say to, <laughs> I've been whipped by this before. It's problematic if you don't know what the purpose is. It's got power. It's fully charged. But who knows what it's supposed to do? But when those two are combined, so the power with the purpose, I should have brought some grass up and I really could have done it properly when you have, didn't think this through. When you have the purpose and the power together, now it's effective, right? It does its job. It does what it's made to do. So I want you to keep that in mind when we talk about purpose and power and how they've got to be um, linked together in the same direction to actually be effective. And we'll talk about what effective means as well a little bit later on. I'll put this down here just for now. Actually, can I keep that a little bit longer because I do have to actually get my weeds. So maybe in a, few, in a few days, I'll hand that back to you this afternoon. I'll get to it. So keep that in mind. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk about the Holy Spirit's power. And uh, the first thing He gives us is the power to be. 
the power to be someone, something. It's in Romans 8, chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, everything was what we were singing about this morning. Because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The power we've been given, we've, we've got the power to be free. In Christ, with the Spirit, we are free. We're free from the power that once brought death. It hasn't disappeared, but we've overcome because there's a greater power and Jesus has overcome. Now, we use this language quite a bit in church sometimes, being free, right? Has anyone else been slightly confused by that term sometimes? <laughs> yeah, we're free, we're free, yeah! What is Free from, I don't get it, free from what? Well, this verse says we're free from the power of sin that leads to death. Let me put it this way. Um, Gravity is a law. It's a power, right? Gravity is something to do with science. I don't get it, but things that are up here fall down here. Dependent to its mass, everything falls down, right? What goes up must come down. That's gravity. That's real. It's a truth. It's a fact. We can't deny it. We can't get rid of it. That's just its law. Everything falls down. It's there. But we can override that law. We can override that, that power with a greater law and with a greater power. That's how we get planes to fly, right? Planes, when they have the power to, with thrust and the wing angle, and when the, power, when the, I don't know, the thrust is greater the, than the weight of the plane and gravity, we get up in the air. Gravity still exists. <laughs> it's still there, but we've actually put a power over it. And because of that, we can have machines in the, in the air that fly us all around the world. It doesn't eliminate gravity. It just overrules it and allows us to be greater than that. There's a greater power available to us through the Holy Spirit. It doesn't eliminate the power of sin. It's still there. It just overrides it. It overpowers it and it overcomes it. You see, without that power, we don't stand a chance against sin and death and evil. Paul also says a little bit later on in that same chapter, he says, so you've not received a spirit. See, Paul always talked about um, the power of the spirit because he knew, man, this is what the churches need to hear, to understand who they are in Christ. He says, so you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. He says, instead... You received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him, so now we call Him means there was a previous, there was an old, now there's a new. He says, now we call Him Abba Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. So this verse alone tells us we've got the power to be adopted with the Holy Spirit in us. In the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to be affirmed, to have that assured. That's what the verse says. The Holy Spirit assures it with us to know that our salvation and our spot in the family is secure. He always he uses the, the language of a seal of the Holy Spirit, not a seal as in like the English singer-songwriter seal or the animal seal, a seal as in like a, a substance or a material that binds two things together. He says, the Holy Spirit gives you that power to be sealed and to be assured that you have been sealed spirit to spirit to God. The power to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be made holy. The power to have purifying work in us that the Holy Spirit does to make us more human, more like Jesus. We sung today this song, um, Set a Fire. You know what fires do, right? That's biblical. God is like a, a fire, like it's a, it's, a, it's a power and it gives light. But a fire also refines and purifies. I don't know much about the mining industry, but I'm sure fire is involved in getting the gold out. So it's going to go through the process of fire. So the gold comes out. That's what the Holy Spirit does. 
He says in Galatians, Paul had a lot to say about this. He says in Galatians 5, verse 16, 17, he says, So I say, he says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Who can attest to that, right? He says they're they're, they're always fighting each other. So you're not free. He He says later on. So you can't carry out what you want to do. He says you can't just let your sinful desire win out. You see, later on he talks about this. He says in uh, the book of Romans, he talks about it's a, he, about himself. He says it's like a battle going on inside of me. He uses the war language. And you might be aware of the verse. He says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I know I should do. It's his battle. He's, he's unpacking the tension that we live in. The tension that we live in with our sinful nature, our flesh, whatever you want to call it, and the Spirit of God. And his answer to that, he's acknowledging it. I think it's really important in church we acknowledge that. That's a tension we're going to live in for the rest of our lives on this side of eternity. Remember, we're becoming more human, yes. But the kingdom, what God's doing, has been inaugurated, but it's not consummated yet. So we're not quite the full human just yet. So there's still that battle going on. But Paul's answer to that tension is saying, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. We talked about last week, being filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be your, um, your, your guide and your lead and your influencer as you live your life. We're not quite get it, we are getting there, but we're not quite there yet. So we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, to sanctify us. The Holy Spirit gives us power to be full of hope, <laughs> to be fruit-bearing. He gives us the power to be repentant, to change our mind and change our direction. He gives us the power to be justified. This is what He makes us. These are all things that we be. This is who we are. It's not even things that we do. So all those things we talked about, it's who you you are. That's what we've got the power to be. Now, the power of being is more important than the power of doing. Who you be is more important than what you do, right? But it doesn't mean that what you do is actually not important at all. It's still important because we've also been purposed and He gives us the power to do as well. And the do comes from the being. That's why I mentioned be first because without the be, you can't do the do. Does that make sense? <laughs> Who we are matters, but what we do also matters. What good is a whippersnipper if it doesn't do anything? <laughs> it's pointless. It's just a piece of equipment. The battery, which is the power, and what it is used for, the purpose, are combined to cut the grass. So we need to figure out our purpose, what God's purpose is for His power through us. I mentioned last week how the, the, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is actually what enables us to live in the kingdom well, to do what He wants us to do in the kingdom, to do good, to put it in biblical terms to do good. There's this moment recorded in the book of Acts where Peter gets a vision and, um, and it's a vision where, where, where God brings down the sheet and it's really just a vision of uh, God telling Peter, hey, guess what? There's no Jew and Gentile anymore. There's no my people and outsiders anymore. He says, everybody is clean because of King Jesus. So that, was, that was hard for Peter. He's a grown man. That was hard for him to understand because he'd been a separatist his whole life. These people were in, the Bible says so in the Old Testament, and these people are outside of God. So this was big news, but it was also good news, hence the gospel, (laughs) good news. Anyway, in the book of Acts, he's, he's explaining Jesus and all He did and all He is and all He had done to some other believers. And He's, he's passing down this, this vision that He got from God and He's saying, this is amazing, Every, every, everybody's in if they profess their allegiance to King Jesus. We're all in. And he says this in the book of Acts. He says in Acts chapter 10, he says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good 
and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now he's referring to this powerful moment when Jesus was baptized in water. And just so happened, he was also baptized in the Spirit at the same time. This beautiful picture, and I've said it before, this, this beautiful image of the Trinity, where Jesus the Son gets baptized, he comes up out of the water, God the Holy Spirit comes down and descends on him and rests on him, and God the Father says, this is my Son whom I'm well pleased. Beautiful connection of the Trinity in that moment. He says he did that, and after he did that, because remember, that moment in time for Jesus, that was the beginning of his ministry. That's when he was set apart. That's when his mission began. And he was, as Peter put it, he was doing good. And he had healings and miracles and proclaiming the kingdom of God. See, Paul also acknowledges... So this was Peter and Jesus. But Paul also acknowledges that he's doing good and everything that he did, preaching, teaching, and everything else of putting up with jail and beating and shipwrecks and bitten by snakes and like a whole bunch of stuff. Paul was also willing and keen to acknowledge, this is the power of God that I can actually do this. And he says this in 1 Corinthians. This is, this is actually a... Um, Well, this is like one of the preacher's favorite verses. (laughs) Because it reminds us it's not about us. It's not about what we say. Now, we look at Paul sometimes, we go, man, he wrote so many letters, 16 of the 22. Like, he did so much. And then he comes along and says, and my message and my preaching was very plain. Rather than using clear and persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust, not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. I love that. He's actually saying, I held myself back. Like I could have, remember, Paul was a smart guy. He could articulate the law and God really, really well and unpack the Bible. But he's like, nah, I don't want to persuade people about God. I want to let God do the work. I'll tell them truth, but I want the Holy Spirit and the power of God to do that. Beautiful. The only way we can do good is through the power of God and through the power of His Spirit. Now, along the lines of doing and doing things, I want to tackle something that is, um, we'll spend the rest of the message on pretty much. And uh, I want to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts that He gives to His people. There are other gifts in the Bible that God gives in the, in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we can call those the gifts of the Son and the book of Romans. They can be gifts of the Father. Uh, but we're talking about the Spirit, Holy Spirit. So we're just going to talk about uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, today. And we're going go, to go through that. So to find out about that, as I said last week, where do we go? There's a tip for you. We go to the Bible. We go, what are the, what's the teaching that we're told? What does the Apostle Paul tell us? about our teaching. We don't look at church culture. We don't look at tradition. We don't just look at experiences, either ours or otherwise. Or don't look just at other teachings. Yes, they all play a part. I agree. But to get our core beliefs, we have to go to the Bible, right? So we're just going to read it through. In 1 Corinthians, he he actually, so he spoke to the Corinthian church. Clearly, they had an issue with abusing and using spiritual gifts because he had to address it in the letter. And it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, Now, now concerning spiritual gifts, <laughs> you can see he's already lashed them like all these other chapters. He's like, okay, next thing, next thing. We talked about worship, we talked about relationships, we talked about marriages, we talked about behavior. And he goes, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, He says, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. Remember, we talked about that last week. I don't want you to be ignorant about it. He said, I want you to know the truth, because clearly there's some lies creeping in. He said, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So here he's saying, no one can declare Lord as their Lord and Saviour unless the Spirit empowers them to do that. No one, everyone can say, Jesus was a good guy. 
You can read the Bible and go, Jesus was a good guy. You don't need the Holy Spirit to give you that faith. But to say, Jesus is God and He's Lord and He's Saviour. I'm going to give my life to Him and I trust He is who He is and He did what He said. So I'm going to give my life to Jesus. For us to get to that point in our faith journey, the Holy Spirit has to pull you in that direction. Anyway, move on. He says, now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. See, different but the same. It's coming into play now. Different gifts, same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. So here He's laid out all the gifts, pretty much, of the Holy Spirit. And um, we're going to put the whole, that whole verse up, it's gonna, just going to whack it up, because we're going to chat about a, a few things in particular. So we'll just keep it up there. Just want to talk about a few things, to, so we make sure that um, we here are on the same page as Paul here. Because we want to make sure that we're living as close to the truth as we can. So it's pretty clear in this scripture here, that God's Spirit gives gifts to men and women. Remember, the very definition of gift is that they're given out of generosity. You don't earn them. You don't pay for them. They're not deserved. They're actually the Greek word. This is written in Greek. The Greek word for spiritual gift is charismata. So charis means grace and mata means gift. So they're actually gifts of grace by definition. They're literally, and gifts of grace mean, you didn't earn this. This is grace. This is, this is a gift for you. It's a gift He graciously gives. Let, let's look at the who, the why, and the when. Who? Who are the gifts from? Holy Spirit. Who are the gifts for? Everyone. Everyone. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, dwelling in you, the gifts are for you. They're not set aside for the pastors. They're not set aside for the ministers or the extra holy or the extra righteous ones. For everyone, that's Paul's language. Male, female, senior, teenager, young adult, middle-aged, everyone. The gifts are for everyone. They're not reserved for the special, whatever the special means. We put a different definition to that. So it's really important we, we know that. Because we need to understand, yeah, like, I don't know how, if you've felt this, but growing up or even now in your faith journey, God's not going to give me a gift. <laughs> I'm not holy enough. I'm not righteous enough. That's the point. <laughs> None of us are. That's why it's a gift of grace. It's not about us. So I'd love it if that's your mindset to start to shift your paradigm of thinking of, yes, I can receive these gifts for His purpose and for His glory. So that's the who. Why? Why are these gifts given? Well, it says in the Scripture, for the common good, for the profit of the people, for the building up of the church, for the edifying of the community. However you want to put it, it's for other people. It's for each other. It's so we can love each other well. These gifts aren't given to satisfy our fascination with the spectacular. They're not given to reach hyper-spiritual levels, like, I've achieved level nine, ding, spiritual gifts. God's not for that. Or not even to affirm or validate your faith and your belief. I'll, I'll, you turn back to that a little bit later on. The gifts aren't given to make us feel special. The gifts aren't given to make us look good. They're given to empower us to love others well. And to serve them well. Let's talk about this. That's the, that's the purpose. 
If I use this purpose for something else, it's problematic. And there's stories in there's stories in the Bible of people using spiritual gifts in the wrong way for the wrong purpose. It was problematic. That was why he had to write a letter to them to sort them out. When does he give these gifts? When he wants. <laughs> at His will, as He sees fit for His purpose. He's a generous God, but He decides. We don't twist His arm. It's not an algorithm or transaction. We put money in this vending machine in the sky, ding, and then He gives a gift when He sees fit for the purpose of His people. So let's look at these gifts for a little bit. We can categorize them as I was... um, as I was learning about them growing up, my old teacher would categorize them into three groups. It's pretty easy, and it's an easy visual. So let's look at the gifts. Uh, first off, we have gifts of what we, what we can call gifts of revelation. So gifts of revelation, this is the gift that reveals something supernaturally, which is beyond logic, and it's beyond common sense. So here we have, in this little section, we have knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. So let's look at those three. So knowledge, so knowledge is a supernatural revelation of precise, accurate and correct facts, past or present. A good example of this is um, in John 4 when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and he's talking about living water and Jesus goes to her, go and get your husband and tell him. (laughs) And she goes, I don't have a husband and he goes, yeah, you're right. He says, you don't have a husband, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now isn't even your husband. The Holy Spirit gave him knowledge. She was dumbfounded. But he didn't use it to condemn her. He was just showing her, I, 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 know, I know you. I am who I say I am. So that's a gift of knowledge. Then we have the gift of wisdom. So the gift of wisdom is a supernatural revelation regarding a future decision, using God's Word and God's power for that course of action, whatever you're going to make. It's a little bit harder to, to define. I mean, wisdom, we use that word, you know, in, in, our, in our earthly terms as well. But the Bible says that earthly wisdom is, is different from God's wisdom. So an example of this could be where um, in the book of Acts, again, see, the Holy Spirit was active in the book of Acts. The church was birthing. And in Acts chapter 9, uh, when uh, just after the conversion of Saul, when, when Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and he changes his name and he sends him off blind. Anyway, he speaks to a guy called Ananias and the guy called Ananias hears from God and God says to him, this is happening over here. I'm telling you what's happening here. What I want you to do is to, uh, when he comes to you, he's going to ask for you. I want you to pray for him because he's going to be one of, the, one of the leaders that is going to preach the gospel to the Gentile, to the people outside of the Jewish culture. He goes, ah, oh, I've heard of that name before. <laughs> he's been persecuting Christians. And it's almost like God saying, Trust me. So Ananias did what he did. Through his wisdom, he heard from God and his course of action was decided. And he prayed for Paul and the scales, what says scales, like fell off his eyes and he could see again. And his ministry begun. That's a gift of wisdom that he was given from God. The gift of discernment is also under the, the gift of revelation. This is supernatural revelation to know which spirit is at work. So the gift of discernment isn't just making good decisions. That is discernment, but it's not a gift. That's called having a brain. But the gift of discernment is to say, this spirit is not of God. And I've been, I've been, I, I know this, what God says. There's a story again in the book of Acts where uh, Paul and the apostles are, are walking through and there's a little slave girl who was possessed by a demon. And she had owners and they would, she was a fortune teller. She could tell people's future. Because you see, the enemy, the, 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 the spiritual realm is real. And the, the demons were in this child. And this child, for days, were following the apostles. And saying, these men are from the Most High God. He, they're going to tell you how to be saved. That's actually pretty good news, right? That's like a bit of a billboard going around. But Paul sent something in his spirit. And after days, it says he was exasperated. And he turned to the girl and he said, demon, he says, be gone from this girl. And the demon left her. He knew it wasn't just a girl helping out. There's something in his spirit because God gave him the gift of discernment for that moment. Side note, uh, because that happened, the, the slave owners weren't happy, of course, because their coin was gone. So they got thrown to jail. <laughs> One of the many times Paul got thrown to jail for doing what God had called him to do. 
So they're the gifts of revelation when God reveals something supernaturally to us. And then we have the next one, the gifts of power. Are we okay so far? We're good? We're understanding? Gifts of power. These are the big ones. This is when something that is accomplished, achieved or received supernaturally through the, through the gift. So under the gifts of power, we can put miracles, we can put healings, and we can put faith. So let's look at miracles. This is a supernatural work outside of the law of nature that God's already put in place. You want to look at miracles? Just go to Jesus. <laughs> Walking on water, that's not normal. That's outside the logic of what water can do and what humans can do on water. Feeding of the 5,000, turning water to wine. There were miracles that was outside of the regular nor- the, the law of nature as we know it. We're putting healings. That's a supernatural restoration of physical or mental status or health or states, moving us towards wholeness and completeness. Again, many, many examples of this. I preached on one of these, a whole message once on John 9, when John healed the man who was born blind. That was a healing. He'd been blind his whole life. His eyes didn't work. And all Jesus did was spit on the ground, make some mud, wipe it on his eyes, go wash it off. And he did, because he had the gift of faith, which I'll get to in a minute. The gift of faith, it's a supernatural ability to believe and receive from God. This is different from your saving faith. Okay, so saving faith, obviously, it's what we, the, the Bible tells us, we're saved through faith. That's, that's our, it's not a salvation thing. You don't have to get a gift a spiritual gift from God to be saved. That's a gift He gives us for salvation. But a gift of faith is like um, next level for a moment in time to believe and receive from God. Like this man, he had a gift of faith because Jesus told him what to do. Paul healed a crippled man in, in Acts 14 and the scripture says he turned to this man and he could see that this man had faith. He could see it. There's a whole bunch of gifts of the Spirit working there in both parties, in Paul and in this man. Long story short, he was healed and could walk. So they're the gifts of power. That's six of them so far. And the last three we can classify as gifts of speech. Or the Bible says utterance, but speech is a bit um, bit easier to remember. Now the gifts of speech is something that is spoken or proclaimed and is a message from God. And under that, we can put prophecy, we can put tongues, and we can put interpretation. So prophecy is a supernatural compulsion that you might have to reveal God's Word or a message from God. And this could be foretelling or forthtelling. So foretelling is telling a, a message from God in the now. Or maybe something He's already said in the Bible. You know, when God speaks into a, a moment and He takes you to His Word or even you just get a word and it's in line with His Word, that's prophecy. You're speaking His truth over people. That's foretelling. But foretelling prophecy is, of course, um, prophesying against things that are yet to come. Examples of this is, um, I mean, Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost happened, Peter was given that gift unbelievably. He just didn't just refer back to the prophet Joel, but he then started prophesying about the truth of Jesus and preaching about this is, this, is what, this is what's happening. The Holy Spirit is here and he preached this killer sermon and uh, thousands of people came to Christ. That's the gift. And then we have tongues. So that's a supernatural ability to speak in a language not previously known to the person who's speaking it. Whether that's a human, a human language or whether that's a heavenly language. Example of this, of course, Acts 2. You know, when Pentecost, when, when Pentecost happened, the Spirit of God came down. We talked about this last week, when people started declaring and praising God, not in their native tongue. Might have been a heavenly language as well, we don't know. But it was a native tongue of somebody who was listening so they could benefit from it. They were speaking another language and Peter had to explain it to them. They were given the gift. They didn't ask for it. They just received it. And then lastly, we have the interpretation of tongues, explaining those other language, those other languages to bystanders. 
There's no biblical record of this actually happening like this person then interpreted this person, but you can assume that this happened all the time. Paul talks about it in, Corinth, in, in a couple of chapters after this one here. He talks about uh, prophecy, he talks about tongues. And he says, in public circumstances, make sure there's an interpreter there so the people can be built up. He says, what purpose is it if no one understands? And then Paul says, he says, I'd rather say five intelligible words that everybody can understand than a thousand words in tongues. Because who does that benefit? So in interpreting that is getting the gift to interpret when you hear tongues or even what you've said as well. But we can, we can actually, we can assume, and I think it's been faithful to the text still, that when tongues and prophecy are mentioned together, or tongues and wisdom or tongues and knowledge, there's some interpretation happening as well. So if tongues are being spoken and a prophecy is said after, it very well could be crossing over. I think that's still being faithful to the, to the gift and to what the Bible's telling us. So here we, ha- here we have the nine gifts, and I, and I drew it up like this, because um, they're all interlocked. Yeah. They're all interlocked. Different times, different seasons, everyone, everything is for everyone. What a gift. What a beautiful gift. Now, yes, this is teaching. Maybe, Frank, just keep this up for a little while longer while we can look at it. Because it looks very teachery, right? And Paul actually, was te- Paul was teaching us. He's instructing us. But did he tell us this so we could pass the test? <laughs> no. He was telling us this so we could live life to the fullest with the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And this is what he desires. God the Father sent the Spirit and desires us to pursue these gifts for the right motives, for the common good, to build up the body. Man, the last couple of weeks, I've been, I have shared with the worship team during the week, man, I've been challenged the last couple of weeks. Do we desire this? Do, let's go one step back. Do we believe this? Do we believe this is for us? Do we believe this is for our church? Can you imagine a community that doesn't just believe it, but believes it to the point where it's flowing through the community? We're prophesying over other people. We've got words of wisdom for other people. Words of knowledge that are going to build people up. That's a powerful community. And not power for, for us, whatever. It's a power because we're being empowered to build us up to go and do work to go and advance the kingdom. These are just questions I'm asking. Should we expect stuff like this? 100%. I'd love us to be a community that earnestly seeks God and His purpose and the power of God will be a natural result of that. But it's about Him, it's not about the gifts and it's not about us. (laughs) But when they combine, it's effective. Effective in the kingdom of God. Let me give you a bit of a story to close. And it's my story. And believe it or not, I've never preached about this, ever. Um, in my early 20s, I was brought up in a fairly conservative, a conservative Christian church. So, I didn't know much about the gifts at all. And I went to a, a, a larger church that was quite Pentecostal and charismatic. Um, I saw some things and I experienced some things. And tongues was a big thing. Because we all know, tongues shows everyone that we're connecting. And I was like, I want that. I want that. I saw it, I experienced it. I'm like, how do I get that? And in my early 20s, I was praying, I was reading books. Reading books? Remember I said something about books? Remember I said last week? Everything you need to know is in here. And if you hear something new that's outside, ask the question, is it from this? Is it interpretation of this? Or is it apart from this? And I talked to people that, that spoke in tongues. And I was praying and I was reading. And for what purpose? I actually don't know. Maybe to prove to myself that I was worthy of receiving a gift from God? Maybe. Maybe because that was a visual representation of faith. I wanted to prove to myself I was a Christian. 
Um, maybe to prove to myself that I'm filled with the Spirit. Maybe to prove to others <laughs> that I'm filled with the Spirit, if we're being honest here. Long story short, I didn't get the gift of tongues in that season. My motive was what I thought was pure, looking back as an old man now. Like, it was, it was, it was immature. Now, God could have graciously given me the gift anyway, but I, didn't think, I think He knew it would, wouldn't have been helpful. It may have even been harmful for me and for my soul. Because these gifts, remember, they're not a badge of honor. They're not for self-grandeur. They're not to proof that you're more Christian than the person next to you. I've spoken tongues, the heavenly language, twice in my life. Twice. And both times was private worship, right? I felt God bypass my brain and whatever was bubbling up in my spirit just came out of my mouth. No one heard. It was, it was just between me and, me and Him. And I haven't, I haven't since then. Now, I'm not saying, as, as, as I've grown up, I've thought, um, oh, I'm, an actually, I'm an okay communicator. <laughs> like I feel I can unpack things for people to build up the body of Christ. I'm not saying because I have this gift, I don't have this gift. Can God give me the gift of tongues again? Of course, of course He could. And I would welcome it. But I'm okay if He doesn't. I don't define myself by the gifts that I receive that I feel are more important than other gifts. Paul only addresses tongues in here because this church thought it was more important than all the other gifts. And surprisingly, this is one of the only gifts that actually you can, you can um, it doesn't build other people up. <laughs> and this church focused on it. And I'm not saying tongues are bad. Tongues is a beautiful gift. Man, it edified me no end. But that's actually helpful too, because it builds me up. So I can then function in the space that I've been put in. I can't turn it on and off like a tap, but I'm okay. I'm okay with that. I know my part to play. And when God decides to give different gifts to different people, we celebrate it and we continue building up the body for good works like Jesus wants us to. Paul also talks about after this, he talks about for two or three chapters, the body of Christ. And he talks about, it. it's coming out of the gift, so that's what he means. He doesn't just mean what you're good at. Everyone's got different gifts and there's unity for all of that. What good if you want to be all the gifts and you're desperate for all the gifts? Then what's the need of a body, right? He says everyone's got different gifts for a different reason, for a different season, but for the same purpose. And that's to build the body up for good works of service. He talks about love. He talks about worship. And he says, you think all these gifts are good? He actually says, I want you to pursue the gifts. That's what I'm telling you as well. I do want you to pursue the gifts. I'm pursuing the gifts. But he says, you know what's greater than the gifts? <laughs> and he writes a whole chapter on love. And he, and he sticks it to him. And he says, you think these gifts are good? I'll give you a higher one than that. And that's love. Because all these gifts, they're going to fade away. He says, but love is going to remain. You can have all these gifts, and if you don't love, it means nothing. That's what he says for a whole chapter. Maybe we'll get the band to come back up at the moment. So I say all of that to say, don't only pursue the gifts, but pursue the person of God. God knows our heart, He knows our intention, and I'm not speaking today to pinpoint anyone or to do anything. I'm telling my story because that was my story. And looking back, for me, God in His wisdom, infinite wisdom, um, held back from giving me that gift and graciously journeyed that with me as I went through life. So I don't know where you are when, it taught, when we get to the gifts and the Holy Spirit and if you're worthy or not worthy or whatever the case may be. We should pursue the gifts, but never, never more than the person of God. And we say this all the time. The presence is the gift. God is the gift. And He will purpose and He will release at times He sees fit for His purpose. So we're just going to close on a song. And um, I wasn't quite sure what our response was to be. And I heard the team singing the song this morning. I had the song, I, I feel... 
I feel, thought. Um, God gave me this, this song for, to close. So I was like, when they were rehearsing this morning, I went and sat down. I was like, well, what are we, how are we going to respond to this? And I um, felt God to say, um, let people move. So what we're going to do, we're going to, well, I'm not going to, but this team's going to sing. Don't trip over the whippersnipper. <laughs> and um, if you'd love to pursue the gifts, or if you'd love prayer for anything, we're not going to limit this to a come down and we'll release the gifts on you. Remember, that's not us. It's not us. But if something shifted in your thinking about gifts or worthiness or value, or you have this prayer point that's stirring up inside of you, or you simply want to respond by getting out of your seat and walking, I encourage you to do that. Just come forward. I'll be down here. Maybe some of the elders can come down as well. And if you do want prayer, come and tap someone that looks responsible and mature. And I'll pray for you while the band ministers to us through song. And I understand this is a cultural thing and sometimes it can be a bit uncomfortable. Can I, I promise you, walking forward is not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of my faith isn't good enough. It's a sign of obedience. It's a sign of I want more. I believe it when, when we sing and when the Bible tells us there's more to come. There's more to come. You're saying is I believe it. But flipping that as well. I'm not forcing people to walk down the front. <laughs> if you don't walk down the front, that's okay. I think only God knows um, what your appropriate response would be. So as we sing, um, I encourage you to listen to the lyrics. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Allow His presence to rest on you. And that's it. There's no expectation outside of that. And you respond how God calls you to respond. So why don't we all just stand and we'll let the team... Um, lead us and we'll see what God wants to do.
Yes, Lord, we believe this. Holy Spirit, may you wash through this place in your people. May you fill this place in the hearts with hope, with love, with freedom. We pray for freedom in this place, God, for people who have been bound, bound by the past, bound by thoughts, bound by behaviors, bound by what's been spoke over them. In Jesus' name, we pray that's broken. We pray that doesn't define who they are. Right now in this moment, Holy Spirit, we pray that you wash that clean and you begin a season of healing. You begin a season of health. You begin a season of looking forward into who they can be in your name. God, you see us. You love us for who we are, but you can see us for who we can be. And we thank you for that truth, God. So Lord, we just pray right now as we, as we leave this gathering, God, we thank you that you don't stop being God. You don't leave us, but you go before us and go with us. So Lord, I pray that anything you stirred inside any of our hearts, God, may there be courage, may there be obedience in seeking, in searching, in asking, in praying, continuing whatever that you have planted in this place today. God, we love you. We want to be an effective church, God. We want to be an effective church in this community. We want people to be set free in the name of Jesus. But we know we can't do that without the power of your Holy Spirit. So we come before you so humbly and ask that you empower us the way we need to be empowered for your purpose. And that is to advance the kingdom, to bring love, to bring hope, to bring light into places where that's void. And we just want to acknowledge today, we can't do that. We won't do that without you and your power. So we thank you that you give it freely. We thank you, call us to earnestly seek that. But God, we seek you first and foremost. We love you. We thank you for being with us this morning. And we pray for blessing over your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you have something you'd love to continue a conversation with, feel free to come down the front and hang around. Um, ladies, we as part of part of what we do is we, we pray for um, pray for our expecting mums. And uh, Zaina is expecting in just a couple of weeks. Is that right? So Zaina's going to come forward after the service. And ladies, we'd love to come and just, just gather up here. And we're just going to pray for her for this new season uh, that she's heading into. Well, that's it for our gathering. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, grab your kids, hang around for tea and coffee, and uh, we'll see you next week.